Good evening and welcome to this fifth district town hall meeting. So glad to see everyone here on this evening. We are here to, to discuss, like you all know, the majority of the people in this room have been hanging out with me for the past and to, since the beginning of time with this. So we know when we have the town hall meetings, there is always a focus. So the focus today is on zoning actions for the fairgrounds. So that's just a housekeeping rule. We're not gonna be all over the place on today. I promise you one thing, is that in the next 58 minutes, we'll be walking out of the door, all right? So with that being said, I am going to ask uh, one of our Neighborhood Association presidents. She is a uh, co-pastor of her church, and that is none other than co-pastor Sharon Stewart of Phyla Terrace to come and pray. Let us receive her. Good evening. Would you bow your heads, please? Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. I thank you for my life, health, and strength Thank you for this beautiful day you let be in this city of ours, Savannah, in the state of Georgia. God, we thank you for all that you do for us as citizens of this city. And because you're not the God of confusion, we ask as we meet tonight with our opinions and our questions, that everything be handled decently and in order, knowing that one day we all will be accountable so in Jesus' name I pray that all be well and bless each and every one that left their household to be a part of this meeting. And when the meeting is adjourned, take us all back safely. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, President and Co-Pastor Stewart. This evening, this town hall meeting is the next in a series of meetings that we have been having over the past several, several years. And that is to keep the residents informed and engaged on the progress of the redevelopment of the fairgrounds. Last week, City Council, uh, proudly, and I'm smiling because I've feeling real good about it. We voted and it was passed for the development agreement with P3JVG to initiate the first stage of the proposed development. And that was followed by, last year there was a purchase and sale agreement that was voted on on city council and passed. Now we are working towards necessary zoning steps. And that is the focus and purpose while we're here today. To allow the development plan to move forward, which is the primary reason for our conversations on today. I am your Alderwoman, Dr. Stella Shabazz, and your Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Savannah. And I am just proud to be here, and I'm just really been feeling real good since last Thursday. We have our city manager here with us, along with the best, and I mean the best team, not just in the city of Savannah, not just in the state of Georgia, 
but in this whole country. And I am talking about Team Savannah. Team Savannah, would you all please stand up so the residents can see you all? Y'all put your hands together for Team Savannah. Thank you all so much for all of the hard work. And there are, there are the majority of you who are here and a part of Team Savannah who has been here since the beginning of time. Our city manager has been working extremely hard since he's been here. As I told him that he has taken us from first base, second base, third base, and now we are at home plate. So without further ado, our city manager is going to take us forward in our town hall meeting. I just want to just kind of uh, just kind of point one person out who who has been here before the city manager was here and who was carrying this thing with us. And that is our assistant city manager, Mr. Heath Lloyd. Y'all put your hands together. <laughs> Stand up like the mayor would say. Stand up, Mr. Lloyd, so everybody can see you. Thank you so much, Assistant City Manager, for just hanging in there. And I've just taken this personal privilege for one more other person, and that is Ms. Marty Johnston. Ms. Marty Johnston, yes. She is the one who walks with the mayor, who leads the mayor, who do everything with our mayor. Thank you so much for being here and was a, has been a vital part of this uh, process thus far. So Team Savannah and everybody else, thank you all so much. Now I'm going to call up the man who really has been, uh, who has been the glue for all of this, and he is our city manager. So glad about it, Mr. Jay Milner. Y'all got to clap for our city manager. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz, Mayor Pro Tem. So good to be in the 5th District. Um, I see so many of our neighborhood association presidents and leaders and residents, and always good um, to be here in the mighty 5th District and to be talking again about the Fairgrounds Project, especially when we have um, so much progress to update um, the community on. Um, a few things uh, just to get out of the way, and, and Dr. Shabazz stole some of this thunder, rightfully so, but. Um, big thanks to Team Savannah, all my colleagues who are in the room here who make um, all the work um, happen day to day. Um, uh, my partner in crime, um, Assistant City Manager Heath Lloyd, who's there every step of the way. Chief of Community Services, Taffney Young, who's with us, is, um, with us and, and, and moves this work forward in immeasurable ways. Uh, my Chief of Staff, Daphne Williams, um, uh, I, our senior Director of Planning and Urban Design, Bridget Liddy, who will talk to you a little bit later. And I see our um, Director of uh, Code Compliance, uh, Ms. Cynthia Knight, here as well, and a lot of Code Compliance members, as well as a lot of members from um, Community Services. So thank you so much. Laura Lane uh, McKinnon, who is the Executive Director of Housing Savannah, Inc. Um, and I know she's going to be excited about some of the information we're sharing today and the information in the development agreement. Um, but I want to start by saying that uh, tonight's meeting is really about the city of Savannah coming to um, the community to update you on a zoning request that the city is making um, is, the, is the lead petitioner on and essentially uh, petitioning itself for a zoning change. Anytime the city is taking lead on, on uh, petitioning uh, for a zoning change, we come and have a meeting uh, with the community to make sure that they're aware of what that zoning um, request is, the process for that, what we're requesting and why, and where there will be more opportunities for the community to participate in that public process. Uh, Ms. Liddy's going to um, end the presentation um, talking about um, that rezoning request, and it's something that we've talked about a lot in the Fairgrounds project. Right now, you may be aware. Uh, most of the parcel there is zoned as um, conservation recreation, um, save 3.25 acres that's already zoned for multifamily use. 
Um, but of course, we're going to be petitioning MPC and then of course the city um, to, good evening, um, to change that rezoning to a small plan development so that we can effectuate um, the development plan and the development agreement. But before we get there, I want to be able to refresh um, everybody's um, memory on the Fairgrounds project, what the winning proposal was, what we've been doing since that proposal um, was adopted by council two years ago, um, and what the development agreement that was recently adopted by council, what that says, um, and what that means for the Fairgrounds project. Um, this is a project, as Dr. Shabazz said, that um, this community in particular and, and Dr. Shabazz and many of you have been working on for many, 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 many years, um, more than 10 years. Um, we've got 2015 as the starting point here, but that was just when the city um, decided to enter in negotiations to purchase the property. But of course, this community has had plans and dreams and hopes for what the for fairgrounds property could mean um, for this community for many, many years before that. Um, I won't go through the entire timeline, but we know the city purchased the property. Um, we put out an RFP for the development of that property. We got three respondents. Uh, the city put out what's known as a best and final offer, um, which had some technical questions to each of the proposals about how it was going to handle things like stormwater mitigation, traffic, conservation, et cetera. Um, through that BAFO process, um, one proposal arose as the best proposal for the site, and that was the proposal um, from a group called the P3 Joint Venture Group. Um, and of course, that proposal was adopted by council in late 2021, and we have been working and negotiating with that group on a development agreement ever since. Um, Dr. Shabazz did mention that we, the, the city did pass a purchase sale agreement, which kind of set the terms for the development agreement last year. Um, it's a long process, it's a complicated process, but we've got to a really, really good spot and we're really um, excited. And of course, through all of that work, um, we have really made it a priority to be with the community on this process. Um, and the thing that I've said as I've been a part of this process ever since the joint P3 Joint Venture Group project was selected, um, at every step, um, my, my primary goal was to make sure that nothing in that proposal changed, that we weren't um, changing the proposal midstream for residents who had been a part of that process, who had gone to all of those community meetings, who had participated in those charrettes, that we were going to make sure that that proposal, uh, which everyone was excited about in late 2021, that those were the same tenants and the same land uses um, that are in the development agreement. And I'm proud to say that verbatim, the things that were included in that proposal are enshrined in the development agreement, and we're going to go over that in a minute. Um, uh, but again, this was a list of public engagement. I know that you can't read that small type, um, and we're sorry about that. Um, but of course, it started in 2017, um, and for many years, you know, this project was moved forward by 5th District Town Hall meetings just like this. And of course, we had open, uh, open house meetings during the RFP process. There were meetings with 5th um, uh, uh, District Coalition meeting, um, members as well, public meetings at the Civic Center, you might all remember, um, in early 2022, that was one of my first meetings involved with the process, um, and then several neighborhood association meetings um, as well. Let me take this moment to um, recognize our um, post one alderwoman, uh, Carol Bell, thank you for joining us and the Mayor Pro Tem. Um, through this process as well, and things that we've talked with the community about, there's been extensive due diligence done with this project. It's been a project that we've been working on for a number of years, but that has given us the opportunity to make sure that we know every inch of that property, and we've done all of the due diligence necessary to move forward with the development of that property. And that includes geotechnical engineering, that includes environmental site assessments, 
lead-based paint and asbestos assessments, tidal searches, ALTA surveys, land use and zoning reviews, wetland site analysis and jurisdictional determination of wetland areas by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which is now delineated on the parcel, water and sewer capacity reviews, stormwater and hydrology reports, neighborhood assessment reviews, a neighborhood housing analysis. We updated the redevelopment plan for Tatumville neighborhood, which is the technical neighborhood that, um, that the fairgrounds is associated with, although the fairgrounds um, is in and among many, many neighborhoods, a traffic impact report, and of course a purchase and sale agreement and the development agreement that was just passed by council. The other really big thing that happened uh, just in the last two weeks is the state, the Department of Community Affairs, awarded the city of Savannah with what's called a One Georgia grant, $2.5 million specifically for the fairgrounds project um, to help with the infrastructure and the construction and development of what we term workforce housing. And really what workforce housing means is housing that's suitable and dignified and available at a level that working families can afford. And we'll get into a little bit of that just here in a second. But that was a really huge stamp of approval um, from the state and from the Department of Community Affairs, as well as some really great infusion of capital assets that are gonna help us make sure that the development that won the proposal is the development that ends up being built. And we're very, very excited about that. So let me just review what that proposal is. I think everyone in the room is familiar with this concept um, chart. You've seen it at every community meeting. You've seen it in every packet. This was the concept chart that was um, in the proposal, the original proposal for the P3 joint um, development partners. This is the concept um, that we're working towards in the development agreement. Um, and what, the, and what the actual development will look like in, in most ways, understanding that these are you know, just boxes, this, this isn't exactly architectural renderings and engineering renderings, but this is how the site will generally be laid out. Um, and that's how we have it structured in the development agreement. Um, the next slide is uh, also was included in the original proposal and this is what I call the land use page. This is what, for me, is the foundational document for everything that moved forward in the purchase and sale agreement and in the development agreement. This chart that was in the proposal outlines exactly how many acreages of the site and for what use it will be used for. This was the proposal that the community um, responded to favorably. This is the proposal that city council adopted. This was the proposal that made it through all of the technical reviews for the best and final offer. And this will be the, and this is the development and the land uses that are in the development agreement and thus will be developed. And I want to review those. It's very, very important to me that the community recognize that we have not changed one thing from the winning proposal to what's in the development agreement. Um, not one thing, and I wanted to be very, very clear about that, so let me go over what those things were. 18.3 acres of recreation, which include one indoor youth sports facility at at least 75,000 square feet, four sports fields at 81,000 square feet, two basketball courts, community gardens, and the Springfield Lake, a new lake. 6.2 acres for studios and creative career development, which include four motion picture sound stages at 20,000 square feet each, a creative exchange network um, at 10,000 square feet. Their proposal included e-gaming, animation, entertainment career training, right? So this was the, um, the film and the movie studios and the entrepreneurial and the, and the, the um, economic um, engagement opportunities that were a part of this proposal and are in the development agreement. 4.5 acres for housing, maxed out at 400 dwelling units in single and multifamily homes, including housing for senior citizens. 
Um, uh, and I want to get to the housing in more detail. Uh, includes this 4.5 acres includes mixed use light commercial, meaning retail, um, shopping, commercial food oriented retail, um, and, uh, uh, and residential services. 2.4 acres for a central park, a green space, a park. Think of like a, a square in downtown. 2.4 acres for a park. 20.5 acres for the wetlands and nature preserve. So this is all on the western side of the property, the half of the, the parcel that's kind of abutting um, the, the rail line. All of that is delineated wetlands. It will be a wetlands park. Um, we're working on making sure there's a trail around that park and some interesting ways to engage in the wetland park there, but 20.5 acres of wetland nature preserve. 11.4 acres of right-of-way and street improvements. So this is the streets and the sidewalks. And then the Springfield Lake, as I mentioned, at three acres. So all of those uses are detailed in the development agreement at specifically those acreages. The purchase and sale agreement and the development agreement set out the development of the project in phases. Um, this is best practice. This is done, one, to protect the city's investment, to protect your interest in the development there, to make sure that our development partners are doing what they need to at each stage um, and uh, before we sell off the next stage to them. Um, it also helps to phase out the development um, in a manageable uh, way. So in the development agreement, you'll see um, that there are five phases to this development. Phase one includes 30 single family homes and 20 townhomes. Um, and just to orient you, this is Netting Street here. Phase one is, is, is slated to be here. I believe this is you know, what was, you know, 63rd Street here, 62nd Street, <coughs> inland, and the parkway. So phase one is going to be 30 single family homes and 20 townhomes. 100% of all of the housing dwellings that will be developed on this site will be for sale or for lease at an affordable rate at different levels. Um, that was a covenant that is put in the development agreement. Um, and for the single family homes that will be for sale, they will be for sale for qualified buyers um, whose uh, household is, does not earn more than 80% of the area median income. Um, for a family of one or two, that's around $55,000 or so. Um, and so we wanna make sure that the monthly payments for those houses aren't more than 30% of their income um, and that we're targeting uh, these home developments for families and for households um, who are working. Um, so this was really, really important for us. Uh, but they're going to be beautiful, new, dignified homes. They're gonna match the character of the neighborhood. They're going to be, uh, the materials that are used are gonna be top notch. This is not um, at all um, uh, a way to downgrade the project. This is actually in our eyes an uplift to the project and these are going to be beautiful, beautiful homes. Um, that's phase one. Phase two are the up to 70 affordable apartments for seniors. I know we've talked about this a lot, that this, was, this is the low income housing tax credit part of the project. Um, I know many of you are familiar with the low income housing tax credit application that was put in last year um, and just barely missed um, being funded. Um, we're supporting that application again this year, um, and, uh, and, and we believe that, that this project is going to garner that low-income housing tax credit support. Uh, but this phase of the project will only be for available for um, residents 55 years and older. Um, phase three are the film studios, sports fields, and basketball courts. Um, phase four, uh, there will be another 60 townhomes uh, for sale or for lease. 
um, your uh, neighborhood commercial spaces, your sports fields, and the finishing of the nature preserve. And then phase five will be 220 apartments and an indoor recreation facility. Um, so these phases and these land uses and the acreages associated with them, again, are verbatim to the original proposal that we've been discussing for two years. So I wanna talk a little bit about the covenants and the housing affordability here, because it's important to me um, and it's important to our community. We know that housing that's affordable and housing that's attainable for everyday folks um, is getting harder and harder in the city of Savannah, right? It's really good news if you own a home already, right? If you own a home and you can manage to pay the increases in, in property taxes um, as your home values go up or you've secured um, your homestead exemption and that doesn't grow, you know, that's good news for property owners. Their property values are going up and that's what generational wealth is all about. But if you're trying to get into the homeowner market, um, Savannah is more and more out of reach for a lot of working households, right? Um, and so what we have to do to, to combat the natural market is to do projects like this which infuse resources and capital um, or otherwise defray the cost of housing so that the end result can be affordable for regular working folks, right? Because we want to have strong neighborhoods where you know, people are living, people are working. You can be a teacher, you can be a police officer, you can be an engineer at Gulfstream um, and, you can work in, and you can live in this neighborhood. Um, so that's what, that's what we're setting out to do. So 37, and for all of the, all of the leased spaces, 37 and a quarter of all of those lease spaces um, will be reserved for um, households making 40% or less of the area median income. 25% of all lease spaces will be for households making between 40 and 60% of the area median income. And 37 and a quarter percent, the remaining percentage um, of all leased units will be for households making between 60% of AMI and 80% of the area median income. This is squarely within what, what our economics would show to be regular working households, right? And we wanna create livable, dignified, great places to live for regular working Savannians, and this project is all about it. For the homes that are for sale, 100% of all of the homes that will be built for sale, 100%, every single one of them, will be designated, you, you can only purchase it if you qualify at 80% of the area median income. And if you sell that home, it has to be sold um, to somebody making the same, right? And those covenants are gonna last for 30 years. Um, these are really, really great housing products that help people who are getting into the housing market, first time home buyers, um, or people who are looking for an upgrade. Um, they can get into the market and they can build um, generational wealth in a place where the housing market is really, really skyrocketing and harder and harder to break into. So we're very, very proud that 100% of these units, 100%, um, are going to be um, are, are designated for regular working households in Savannah. I'm super excited about that. Um, so that's the development agreement. The development agreement also talks about ways in which the city protects itself. If the developer's not doing what it needs to do, um, we can claw back um, uh, certain phases or um, not let them move forward. Um, it protects the community's interest by spelling out exactly what was in the proposed document and putting that on paper. They've already signed that development agreement. They're gonna have to develop um, what they planned um, and what they proposed. So this development agreement really moves us forward in that way. And the one Georgia grant that we received from the state um, helps us make sure that we're shovel ready for phase one in about 60 days. So we're gonna close on phase one we're gonna sell phase one of the project to the developer in less than 60 days. 
and that project's gonna be shovel ready. You're gonna see new homes, new single family homes, and new townhomes being built on that property and the infrastructure associated with it. Um, so we're really, really excited about that. Before that can happen, the property needs to be rezoned. We've always known this. This has always been part of the plan um, and the development agreement and the purchase and sale agreement, as well as, frankly, the proposals laid out that the city would be the ones who are, um, who are laying out those plans for um, uh, the rezoning. So I'm going to ask um, Director Bridget Liddy um, to talk to you a little bit about what the specific request for rezoning will be. Thank you, Bridget. And then we can answer all the questions you've got. Good evening. My name is Bridget Liddy. I'm Director of Planning and Urban Design with the City of Savannah. And as uh, Mr. Melder mentioned, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about our rezoning process. Um, we have four key things that we need to focus in on um, with our rezoning process. And the good news is, is one of them is already done. Um, we have an archaeological assessment, phase one. We have a future land use map amendment. You might have seen some signs up and around the fairground site. Um, that's what it is for. And then we have the development of regional impact that needs to be conducted by our Coastal Regional Commission. And then from there, we move forward with the rezoning. So we're looking at approximately 60 plus acres of land here. Um, and so it's, it's a definitely a big, big task that we have in front of us. But the main thing is, as Mr. Melder was talking about, we're taking all of those aspects of the development agreement and pulling them into the zoning in order to ensure that it will happen. Um, so we're real excited about that. Next slide. Thanks. Um, so we completed the archeological assessment back in August, or excuse me, April of 2022. The great news is, is that um, our annual contractor, Brockington, went ahead and did the report and found that there were no issues um, with cultural or historical assets at, on the site. So that aspect is good to go and we are done with the archeological assessment. The next item on our list, as I mentioned, the signs are already up, is the, the future land use map amendment. So in our comprehensive plan that we have, um, we have land throughout the county and the city that's been designated to be a future land use. Um, for this particular site, it's been identified um, as park and conservation. And so with that, what we need to do is change that future land use map to plan development. The plan development gives us the flexibility to have the different uses on the site and allows us to have standards in order to ensure that it's going to meet the standards that, that we want to have for the property. Next slide, please. So the other item that we need to do once the future land use map goes through the planning commission, which will be presented tomorrow, they will make a recommendation and then it will go to city council. City council will then officially make a recommendation. Once that process is done, then we will immediately submit what's called a development of regional impact to our Coastal Regional Development Commission. They will review it over a period of 30 days and get feedback from different organizations as well as surrounding jurisdictions as to the impact of the development um, on the site and, and its, in its surrounding area. And so that will take approximately 30 days to do. Once that's completed, then we will go ahead and proceed with doing our rezoning map amendment. And currently, it's Conservation Park. Um, and let me just show you on our map over here. Um, it's all of this area in here that's Conservation Park. Um, as Mr. Melder mentioned, there is a small portion that's been pulled out, about two and a half acres that's been pulled out um, to support the senior housing. So that will also be part of our, our mix when we're looking at our rezoning. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going from this designation of conservation park to a designation of planned development. Next slide, please. Um, so conservation park, this is just a definition of, of what it is. I wanted to make sure that you were aware of what it's currently zoned. And it was zoned this because it used to be a fairground, right, where we had lots of special events and, and community activities. But what happens is with this particular definition of conservation park, next slide, it limits you on the type of uses that you can have at this location. So right now, you can't really have any townhomes or single-family homes 
or the, techno the um, studio space. So what we need to do is kind of take this zoning designation and put it aside and create the plan development. The plan development will reflect what was, what was reviewed by Mr. Melder with that development agreement and the breakdown of those different phases. And so this is the definition of a plan development, um, gives us a lot more flexibility, and it's intended for sites where the developer proposes and the mayor and aldermen desire to achieve a certain mix of uses, appearance, land use capabilities, and or apply special sensitivity to the character of the site of the surrounding area. And that's exactly what we're gonna do based on the breakdown of those different phases that are there. Um, the previous zoning map amendment that had to do with the multifamily senior housing had several different conditions that were associated with the rezoning. Those conditions will stay in place. We're not, we're not changing those at all. If anything, they'll be incorporated into the plan development. So our next steps um, from where we sit right now, we're meeting with you tonight. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, tomorrow we will have our Metropolitan Planning Commission meeting where the future land use map will be presented. Um, as mentioned, a recommendation will be made to City Council. We anticipate it going in front of Council tentatively on May 23rd if everything goes according to plan. Um, following that, we will submit the DRI to the Coastal Regional Commission. And then following up in August, we will move forward with the zoning map amendment that will have to go to the Planning Commission as well as to City Council. And what I can tell you is that we will have additional um, dialogue with you all in reference to um, the rezoning um, once we get through this future land use map. Um, we want to make sure that we're looking at the appropriate uses. I know that there was some concern about alcohol um, being available in this area. We want to make sure that that's going to be on the list as far as a prohibited use. Um, so we'll have a lot of interaction um, in the future, the next couple months this summer. So I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. So I know that Bridget and I just like threw out a bunch of bureaucracy and process and um, that I know you all understand sometimes um, I question whether or not I do. But essentially the, the news here is that the development agreement that we've all been working towards and the proposal that you've all um, learned and helped shape over the years has been codified by city council. Um, and that's the proposal that's going to be designed. In order to do that, um, we're going to need to change some aspects of the zoning to allow for those specific uses. And that's that process that's happening now that Bridget said. Um, uh, Dr. Shabazz, with your permission, I'd like to answer any questions that anyone has about the development agreement process, about um, the planning commission process and the rezoning effort, um, or any question you have related to the fairgrounds property. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Yes, ma'am. Understood. So, um, and I think this gets back to what a little something that I was talking about earlier. In most cases, when you're when you own a home and your property value goes up, that's a really good thing for you for your long-term investment. Um, but that's provided that you know you're you're going to be able to pay the property taxes on that property, right? And for a lot of our residents, especially those who have retired and are on a fixed income, um, making adjustments um, to those, you know, annual tax and, you know, you know uh, uh, valuation changes, which results your tax rate, are can be problematic. Um, I think what the 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 tool that we have in Chatham County that many other counties in the state don't have is a is a, an exemption, um, and I know that everyone here is familiar with Stevens Day tax exemption. But that locks you in. So if anyone here owns any property in and around the fairground site or anywhere in Savannah and you don't have your Stevens Day homestead exemption, please go to um, the, the county tax commissioner's office and apply. 
I think the, the, the deadline has already passed for this year, um, but you'll be, you'll be able to do that for next year um, and make sure that you lock in your property value rates, right? And what that does is locks in your property valuation and it can only change incrementally for some taxing authorities and not at all for others. Um, and that's the only, and that's the tax, that's, you'll just be paying taxes on what that locked in valuation is. Your property value will continue to rise and you'll be able to, to reap that benefit whenever you sell it or whenever you leave it to your children or your heirs or however you want to manage your estate, but you'll only have to pay taxes um, at that assessed value, no matter how high your assessed value goes up. So, no, ma'am, that's anywhere, anywhere else. So what we hope that the fairgrounds development will be a positive amenity for every neighborhood around it, right? That's also why, um, so I know you're, you're talking about tax rates specifically. The answer for, I, I don't know whether or not the, the fairgrounds development is going to raise property values. Um, there, I, I hope they do in, in some cases, especially for those homeowners who want their property to increase in value. But, but what we also need to make sure is that everybody's got their, their homestead exemption there. Um, and there are other exemptions for senior citizens and others that, you, that we need to make sure that you're taking advantage of. So I'm gonna ask and task um, Ms. Coleman and the neighborhood services team, like we'll make sure that we focus in and get the tax commissioner down specifically to the fifth district as we continue this development to make sure and we'll knock on some doors let's make sure everybody has their their homestead exemption because that's going to lock in your tax rate um, so that's the answer to that question the the other way that i think this development's going to impact surrounding communities are the amenities that it provides we're not just building the park we're not just building the nature conservancy we're not just building the the recreation center and the ball fields for the people who are going to live in these 390 units right we're building this for the community at large and for everyone in and around um, the fairgrounds and in and around the fifth district to be able to enjoy um, so we hope that that's also a value add to your neighborhoods and to your, your community now yes ma'am Yes, ma'am. Um, the fifty-five plus are the senior dwelling single single housing, not have to get on the elevator kind of thing. Or, you know. Uh, there, I think it, it it'll likely be two. I think it's slated for two stories, maybe three stories on one section of the building. But there's a height limit there, um, and uh, there will be elevators and accessibility there. No, ma'am, this will not be gated. The streets that we build in uh, will be city streets. They'll be connected to um, the surrounding streets, and we want the surrounding neighborhoods to enjoy the parks and the recreation facilities and the amenities that are being built in the fairgrounds. Okay, yes, ma'am, I'll get to you. With the, um, um, the, 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 Lady in the in the back had her hand up first. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Lacey Wilkin, and I just want you to clarify um, on this property you understand there's so many acres that you all uh, deserve. And is this the Bella area that you reserve it, and what are you reserving it for? Yes, ma'am. So let me, if we can go back to the um, yes. Or go back to the, so I, I know that you're not going to be able to read this, but I'm going to read it out to you. So when, when Bridget, when Miss Liddy used the word flexibility, she's using that in terms of what the property is zoned for now. Right now, the property, the whole parcel, because it used to be a fairground site, is zoned for recreation and conservation, right? Used to be fairgrounds, there's wetlands on it. That's what the property was zoned for. In order to build the housing, in order to build the film studios, 
in order to build the indoor and outdoor recreations, um, we have to change the zoning on the parcel in order to legally be able to develop there. So the, the, the flexibility in the zoning is just going to be flexible enough to build what the development agreement sets out that it will build, which is, and again, which I kind of talked about that land use document being the foundational document of the proposal, which we've carried through in the development agreement. Those are the only uses that are in the development agreement, and this will be attached to the, um, to the zoning so that these are the only things that are available or zoned capable of being developed, and I'll, and I'll repeat them again, 18.3 acres for recreation, 6.2 acres for film studios and creative career development spaces, 14.5 acres for housing, 2.4 acres for a central park, 20.5 acres for wetlands and nature preserve, 11.4 acres for right-of-way, those are the streets and the sidewalks that will be new, and then a three-acre lake. So in the studios and in the development agreement, it's specified, I believe it is phase three, that uh, four sound studios at 20,000 square feet can be developed in phase three of the project. So the film studios, the sound, the sound stages or film studios, which are the same thing, interchangeable, sorry for using two terms, the film studios the, the proposal called for four of them at about 20,000 square feet each, um, and that's what the development agreement calls out as well. So the zoning will allow for, the zoning that we're seeking will allow for the development of those four film studios. Let me get to her and then I'll come back to you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in phase one, there will be 30 single family homes, single family detached homes. homes, yes. Okay, they will be detached together, or, or they'll be single homes, period. Just single homes, just sing, sing, yeah, just okay. regular old homes, okay. four, four walls around it. Okay, and um, 20 town homes? Yes, ma'am. Because I know that's two story. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there will be up to 70, up to 70. But you're starting at a lower amount and then adding? Well, I think that it's not that we're starting at a lower amount. I think the project is actually going to end up being 66 units. We don't know that for sure. We just know that the maximum that will be allowed is 70 units mm -hmm. for the senior um, citizen, uh, the, 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 the apartments for senior residents. Um, so there will be a total of, so there will be roughly, well, there's a cap. There will be no more than 400 housing units on the site. Right now, we think there's going to be about 390 total. Um, but let me tell you, so let me just review what they are. Um, so there's going to be 30 single family homes, the, the regular homes. Um, there are going to be a total of 80 townhomes. Um, there is going to be up to 70 um, apartments for senior citizens. And then there will be 220 other apartments. And let me specify these apartments, and this is in the development agreement. These apartments, there will be no one-bedroom apartments. These are two-bedroom and three-bedroom apartments, and it specifies no student housing. 
Um, so we're, we're really looking for to build family housing units. So that's what those 220 apartments will be. Did I answer your question, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. You know my concern is the traffic study. Yes, ma'am. Um, how that will impact the neighborhood and take a bill of blood foul cost. You know, we discussed Mary Street and how um, when people, some, some families, when they step out of their home, they're stepping out on Mary Street, even with the incoming and going out of 63rd and 62nd Street, how that's going to impact uh, the, the residents on those streets. Mm -hmm. So if you can just let us know how we're going to that because we also have the, the, um, the bumps. Speed bumps. Speed bumps. We, we, we're going to have the speed bumps and we're going to be putting in additional traffic calming measures all along the site. Along Medding Street, I'm not going to step away from the microphone because I want you to hear me, but um, if we had a big map and, and Bridget will point. So along Medding Street, we're going to be widening Medding Street. Now, we're not going to be widening Medding Street to the east, right? So if you live along Medding Street and you walk out your front door and you look across from the fairgrounds, you know, your property isn't going to change, right? Your property line isn't going to change. But we're going to widen Medding Street on the other side, on the fairgrounds side, so that we can widen Medding Street there um, and create some additional traffic calming measures there along Medding Street. Um, uh, we're also going to be, um, we're going to be extending, um, Fountain Street into the project, um, 60th Street into the project, 61st Street into the project, 62nd Street into the project, and 63rd Street, um, into the project, as well as Kimball Avenue. Um, and then, of course, we have a street here that we've tentatively named WW Law Avenue, which is gonna connect um, to, the, to the block west of Fountain Street, so um, on the north side. So we're, we're really working on that neighborhood connectivity so that, we can sp so that we can spread the traffic out. I'll say that the traffic impact study was done um, and the, this was the proposal that had a traffic count that was within what we thought was going to be the allowable limit. We are going to, yes, ma'am. Did you say Fountain Street? Yes. Um, because Fountain would be a, a block over from uh, Medding. Medding, yes. And that yeah. would be going into the neighborhood of Fountain Can we get back to, yes, ma'am. So, yeah. All right. Medding Street. Heading yeah. north into Father Park, Fountain Street, right, and Father Park. Right. It's gonna, it's gonna, you know, we're gonna want connectivity there, right? So Father Park can come and enjoy this new park, and come and enjoy the nature preserve. It can get to the recreation spaces here, right? The same as kind of extending the grid in from 63rd Street to 62nd Street and 61st Street. You don't want this to be, um, we don't want this to feel like a gated community, we want this to feel like an extension of the surrounding neighborhoods. But to your point, um, we, we are going to have to, and the development agreement specifies that it's the city's responsibility, we are going to have to make roadway improvements likely along 61st Street, 62nd and 63rd as they exist now. So. Um, you know, whether that's repaving, um, there aren't a lot of room for sidewalks there, but if we can put sidewalks there, um, but we'll have to reach out to the, to the property owners and to the residents along those streets uh, when, we get to that, when we get to that portion of the project. We're not going to get to that portion of the project until we feel like we need to make those improvements, but I think that generally speaking, residents who are living around the fairgrounds are going to see because that we need to make some improvements to the infrastructure, they're gonna see improvements to their own infrastructure made as well. Did it, you're looking at me like I didn't answer your question. I feel like I'm not gonna get a good grade in class, Dr. Jones. You did, and I understand that, because we wanted to know that impact, because on 61st, I'm on 60th, we 
have another name that's on 61st. Mm -hmm. And then you, you're talking about coming into the, into the fairground, I mean, into the pro property from 63rd and 62nd Street. Those two streets do not have um, curbing. We, we've talked that's about right. that. Yeah. And, and some of those homes are stepping almost out into the street when they come out. They are. As well as at this, yeah, 67, and then and on 59th Street, you know, so when they start coming in, it's just like we were, we were saying before, when they start coming in, they will come, they will use any of the streets that's there. They, you know, because they'll start coming from 59th, they'll start coming from um, the north part of Medley Street down to the fairground from the, from the south side. The, um, from Mary coming to the fair mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the, that's what, if you can take and visualize what I'm, what I'm saying there, it's going to be an impact on the whole name, you know, the whole area. You know, yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and with that, you know, when we talk about the fairground, we, 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 were, we were told that the fairground is in Fowl Park. But the fairground separates Fowl Park and Taylorville. Mm -hmm. mm. Um. Yeah, and I think I've told you before, we, I, I am not going to make the determination on what neighborhood it's in. We, it can be, we, can, we can vote, but I think the, uh, you're absolutely right that traffic patterns are going to yeah. change. You're going to have about 400 new households. Now, that doesn't add the kind of traffic impact that it seems like it adds, and we can share the traffic impact studies. But again, this proposal came under the traffic count that we felt was appropriate for development. This was all two years ago. Um, um, but I think what you'll see, too, is improved infrastructure. We know that we've done traffic calming along Medding Street, a lot of it. I think we need a little more of it. And I think we're going to need more than speed tables, right? So um, we even have a plan in the development agreement for a traffic light right at the city's expense should it come right so those are going to be things that we know are going to be a part of this development and i hate to say that communities are going to get upgrades in infrastructure because something new is coming right because you deserve it anyway but what i can say is that you know let's not you know let's not miss a good opportunity to upgrade the infrastructure where it's needed because you know there's some resources going into this place. We just want to bring it to the city Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma One more question. One more question. Yes, the time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. One more. You, you got it. All right. Her hand was up. I'm going to use one more. The lady in the back. Her hand was up. Okay, I'd like to say I have vision impairment, so I can't see the screen, so that's my problem. But the bottom line is, um, I'd like to know, in layman's terminology, maybe from an engineering standpoint or whatever, how would it affect, I live on the corner, I'm on the north side of 61st Street, on the corner of Fountain, and I wanted to know when you said Fountain Street, I'm on that corner, <coughs> how would it affect, could you give me a visual and a layman's terminology, Yes. An engineer, so, how would it look, just generally, how would it look if I'm on that corner, Yes, ma'am. And I'm facing the fairground parallel, north right. side of Sixty First. Right. And um, the whatever side of the fountain. So you. Very corner. Yes, ma'am. I'm. I got you. I know exactly where you're at. So right now you look across Sixty First Street at a fence. I do. Right. I do. When this is done, you're going to look across the street at a single-family home or a townhouse. Okay. And there's going to be um, a sidewalk in front of that townhouse and a, and, a, and a new streetscape along, certainly along that, the, the, the south side of that 61st Street when you look across. So instead of looking at a fence and an empty field, you, you're, gonna have a, you're gonna have a beautiful new neighbor and a beautiful new single family home or townhouse right across the street from you. What is Fountain going to look like? Uh, Fountain, so Fountain Street is gonna look like Fountain Street is now, but it, it's gonna, you know, right? It, it doesn't it doesn't progress any further south from 61st Street on our plans. It doesn't cross 61st Street, so it's gonna it's gonna end at 61st Street just like it does. But the thing that changes is instead of a fence, there's gonna be housing and sidewalks. So you can walk you can walk south down Fountain Street, and when you get to 61st Street, 
you'll be able to cross 61st Street onto a sidewalk and you can go left or right, east or west, and you can go down to Medding Street or you can go down to uh, what we're calling um, WW Law Street on the map and then go south into right next to the park that's going to be built into the indoor recreation field. So you're going to have access to all of those amenities off of 61st Street, but Fountain Street will not extend any further south than where it is now. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you all so much. Thank you.